implementation of their programs. And as an activist, as a groundist, as we like to call ourselves, uh, my work would be to be on the ground, to tangibly engage with people, even if it means engaging people one by one in various communities, starting with rural communities before getting to urban centers, to make sure that people understand that the NYDA is there to help them with the challenges that are facing young people in this country today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and thank you, Ms. Siabe, for the responses that you have provided so far. I have picked up, um, as you had noted, the issue of groundness, and it, it, it works a lot with uh, the issue of uh, actually working with different stakeholders to achieve your intended objective. And I'm sure that you would agree with me when I say that the work of uh, youth development as a whole is not for the NYDA alone. So now, how best would you lobby and advocate for the integration and mainstreaming of youth development programs uh, across all spheres of government, the private sector, as well as civil society? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I'm a little excited about it. Uh, please excuse my, my smile. I might just smile a little too much. Um, but in, 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 in integrating stakeholders and particularly looking at the various spheres, not only of government, but civil society as well, one must note that they have an obligation and a responsibility to the development of young people. And mine is to engage them through not only their CSI projects, corporate social investment, but their CSOs as well, but also to look at their self-interests. I think when we look particularly at civil society, when we look at the corporate environment, um, the private sphere rather, we should be able to take into cognizance what their self-interest is and be able to use that self-interest to be able to benefit young people and to perpetuate or to essentially extend um, the services that they have to provide to young people. Yes, the NYDA is not a one-stop shop for all youth um, challenges in this country. It, it's not possible. It, it would be a mammoth task for the NYDA NYDA to take up, and I believe that it shouldn't attempt to take it up. The little that it has done and will continue to do, hopefully with myself on the board, will be able to enable it to partner up with stakeholders that are already doing work. I mentioned um, earlier on the work that I did with the Department of Basic Education. They have an amazing program called the Girls and Boys Education Movement across the country that teaches young people um, some of the values and principles that are found within the NYDA. We need to be be able to partner with um, entities and government departments such as those. We need to be able to look at, for an example, the Tabombeki Youth Hub that um, perpetuates and speaks to education, that also speaks to um, inviting young people and training young people um, with various skills. We need to be able to partner up with people that will perpetuate and further the agenda, not only of the NYDA, but particularly of addressing the challenges that young people face in this country. It is possible and it is a task for us to just leave it to the NYDA and I believe considering my experience and the various organizations such as UNICEF that I've been able to work with so Mafco Trust uh, which is the Solomon um, Solomon Masangu um, Trust um, College I think I will be able to be able to facilitate that interaction and those kinds of meetings and stakeholder engagements to be able to better the work of the NYDA and also these stakeholders and their programs thank you Just for interest sake, uh, Ms. Yabe, have you ever went to the head office of NYDA? Yes, I have been fortunate enough to go to the head office of the NYDA when I was on a television show called One Day Leader. We had to debate um, in, in, and advocate for the work of the NYDA, and I was fortunate enough to go to the head office and I was able to meet the CEO, the current CEO, Wasim Karim, and we were able to also invite him to the studios of the SABC and also debate in front of him. I would like to encourage all members, if they have time, to. To, um, you, you're more than welcome to Google that debate. I'd like to believe that I made the NYDA proud in advocating for it and its programs. And yes, yes, ma'am. Honorable Baka. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Just, Chair, I've, I've, 
I have a sense of who you are and what you do and the interest that you have in terms of young people. But I just want to get a concrete kind of um, proposal from you. Um, what do you foresee um, as signs of economic breakthroughs for young people? What should be done to address youth unemployment? Because if you look at the current situation that we are in, in terms of COVID-19, um, on the 350 rents that people get, it's more young people who are on the queue to get that. Mm -hmm. now, now, what interventions do you have in mind if you were to be appointed to be in this position that we're looking for? What is it that you think should be the first thing that we do to make sure that uh, young people get employment or we break this cycle of unemployment around young people? Thank, Thank you. you very much for your question. I am particularly very worried about the continuous dependence that young people have on the social grant system and what that then means also for the state. And particularly what I have identified as a possible solution is the industrialization process. I believe that the fact that we are importing goods, basic goods like spoons, uh, cups, um, and other necessities that we use in this country is, is, is ridiculous. I believe that young people have the capacity, they have the means, they have the skills as well. They just need more development around those skills to be able to produce and to manufacture and to enter into the manufacturing industry, to be able to produce goods that we use on a daily basis. So for me, it would definitely be around the industrialization um, of, of our economy and seeing how young people can use basic skills like pottery, basic skills like welding. Um, I myself in high school studied um, electrical technology where I learned how to weld and to do the things of electrical technology and today I can make my own jewelry. I made my own earrings, right? So those basic kinds of principles and skills should and need to be imparted onto young people and I think a more industrialized non-neoliberal um, approach to the economy would definitely work in alleviating a lot of the unemployment that we see today. Thank you very much Chair and uh, Thank you for your response, uh, Mrs. Sabi. But I've heard you on your presentation, you know, uh, 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 highlighting the, the shortcomings of the NYTA mm -hmm. and uh, to perform its mandate. Then, uh, if so, what are, you, what are you proposing then to strengthen the board and making sure that it, it performs to its mandate. Thank you very much for your question. Um, upon application and upon applying to the board, I decided to further capacitate myself by attending a course with IMSIMBI around monitoring and evaluation. I believe that this course will be able to assist me to properly evaluate um, the NYDA's programs, to properly evaluate and monitor its implementation. I believe that it is very outsta outstanding that the NYDA has um, received six clean audits to date. Um, that kind of leadership from a national um, agency of its kind hasn't been seen before, especially with the high numbers of corruption and looting in this country. I believe that by capacitating myself with this m and &E, I will be able to thoroughly be able to evaluate the programs of the NYDA because you must also understand, Honorable Member, that the access that I have to the work, the programs, and um, the results of those programs from the NYDA are public knowledge. But by being on the board, I will be able to get first-hand information that other people aren't able to receive, which will be able to, inf will help me to, will help to inform me, sorry, um, on better strategies 
strategies and plans going forward on how to improve the NYDA and assist it in implementing its mandate. But let's also remember that the NYDA also works within the framework of the National Youth Service as well. I think with the National Youth Service, there's a lot of work that can be done, that should be done, and that will be done um, going forward with my participation in the board because it's centered around skills development and training, and I'm very passionate about that, being as a, a groundist and activist and consistently wanting to engage with young people. Thank you very much, uh, honor, uh, honorable members. Uh, honorable uh, Ndongeni. Thanks, Chair. Ms. Yari, the National Youth Development Agent was established by an Act of Parliament, NYDA Act 2008. Could you briefly elaborate your understanding on the functions of the NYTA in terms of the act? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for your question, Honorable Member. Um, Act number 54 of 2008 allows the NYDA to promote and to essentially work around um, youth matters that are particularly around um, not only unemployment, but other socioeconomic programs. And I believe that the act also enables the NYDA to be able to not only, um, not only share um, and participate in other stakeholder engagements, but it also allows it to be able to spread its wings in terms of being able to effectively implement and change the lives of young people. Thank you. Any other member? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yabe. Do you have any question? I am particularly... Uh, uh, for as long as you are not asking us about the act, because it's us who ask you about the act. No, that's pretty... <laughs> That's fine, Honorable Chair. I am particularly interested with the amendments um, to the Act, um, particularly around the youth engagement and the youth participation. Uh, the last time that the amendment or the Act had any youth engagement was during, in 2006, during the Youth Convention. I'm particularly worried about the fact that the Act is now going to be presented to Parliament without youth engagement. And by youth engagement, I don't mean stakeholders with NGOs and so forth, but grassroots youth engagement. So I'd like to find out more, what are you doing? Um, as the committee to ensure that Utandi in Kofimvaba, that Utabo in Silagulele is able and understands the act and what it means to amend it and what that will translate for him as an individual along with his community. Okay. Uh, Honorable Mpiti. Thanks, Chair. I think this is a very important question, and it's a question that we've been dealing with um, at the Portfolio Committee when the NYDA appeared uh, before us. And we, as a committee, indicated to the NYDA that, you know, the footprint of the consultations, as well as the department, the Department of Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities, that we need to leverage particularly the offices, the offices of the NYDA in the different provinces to be able to do that active public participation with young people. Because you are correct, um, the, the document in itself has not gone to all young people. It has not reached young people in different areas, particularly rural areas. So we have made submissions uh, to the department as well as to the NYDA to say that one, um, the offices of the NYDA must be used as spaces in which young people are able to come into those spaces, engage the document, share their views, and those views to be uh, tabulated and sent back um, to the department as well as to the committee. We've also made um, submissions again to the department itself to broaden its stakeholder base um, because you are correct to say that there are certain NGOs and stakeholders who receive 
uh, um, these, you know, these communications. And, and that is always at times at the detriment of the larger group of young people in society. And so we've stated very categorically to the department um, that there must be broader uh, consultation. There must be broader consultation, not only with political youth organizations or NGOs or youth structures or youth, uh, um, uh, you know, organizations, but we must start to do the work of involving um, some of the young people. So we will be looking at the department's uh, feedback uh, when, when Parliament comes back to, to see how they've implemented those strategies that we've given them uh, from a portfolio committee perspective. But it is noted and um, it has been submitted to the department as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Honorable PT. You represented uh, the facts about uh, the NYDA amendment uh, bill, that um, those are the concerns that we have raised. And uh, we, in fact, uh, requested the department to extend the closing date. And uh, maybe what we need to check, uh, we'll have to go back as the portfolio committee and check uh, how far have they uh, publicized that uh, NYDA amendment Bill, and then we'll take it from there as the portfolio committee. If because for the mere fact that you are raising it with us, it means uh, maybe there was no enough uh, consultation with young people of uh, South Africa. So um, I'm sure even us as the portfolio committee, if it comes uh, before us, then we'll have to do a thorough consultation with all the youth uh, in all provinces. But thank you very much for, for raising a very pertinent issue with us, which has uh, an interest uh, of the young people. Thank you very much. We wish you good luck. Uh, fly safe back to Gauteng. Uh, in, with regards to the outcomes of the interviews, you will be informed in due course after we have uh, concluded the whole interview and uh, maybe um we'll be finalizing our report next week if i'm not mistaken and then uh, all successful candidates will be notified by our committee but thank you very much thank you chen thank you to everyone especially thank you for risking your health to some degree um just to, to allow me to sit before you i hope you have a great rest of the day and you conclude your interviews well Goodbye. Thank yeah, thank you very much. Jefferson, I'm back on the platform. I just had some electrical. Yeah, thank you, Thank you. I just had electrical difficulties here. Okay, all right. Your candidate. Okay, it's in so another ten minutes.
Pele five minutes, smell can date. Chairperson, um, our next candidate is Tando Kumedene. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, good afternoon, um, Advocate Kumede. Welcome to the interview um, for the board of the NYDA. I would love you to sit down, relax, give us a big smile, drink some water if you are a bit stressed. I want to give you the reassurance that this interviews will be very will be a fair process. And um, I I really want you to relax and enjoy the interview. Before I give over to the chairperson and the members in the committee room to introduce themselves, let me take the opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Meren Shekilian. I'm the chairperson of the Select Committee of Health and Social Services in the NCOP and also the co-chair of this committee dealing with the filling of the vacancies on the NYDA board. I, I really need to welcome you and hand over to the chairperson to introduce herself and the rest of the members. Thank you. Thank you very much, chairperson. Um, yeah, Tandung, we know right, you are there. My name just is- Just smile. <laughs> My name is Nontlantla Ngubendaba. I'm the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee of, on Women, Youth, and Persons with Disabilities. I'm co-chairing with the EHA this panel. Good day and uh, welcome, uh, Advocate Kumete. I'm Honorable Masiko, Figile Masiko, the member of the committee. Uh, good afternoon, Advocate Kumete. My name is Otro Malika, a member of the subcommittee. Thank you, Chair, and a very good um, afternoon to you, Advocate Kumete. My name is Louis Olompiti, and I'm a member of this committee, and I'm wishing you well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Ndingu Teliswa Mkweba Ilungale Committee, SISEC Advocate Committee, and Wamkilekil. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Advocate um, Kumede. My name is Natasha Nklangweni. I'm a member of this committee, and best of luck with the interview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Assistando. My name is Luitumelo Joyce Maluleke, member of this committee. And I can say chairperson. Thank you, chairperson. In Shikani Sestando. Good afternoon, sister. Tony Brenda Matebula, a member of this committee. I'm a member of this committee. Thank you. Don't get me. 
Thank you, members. Um, advocate, can you take um, the opportunity to tell the panel more about yourself, who you are, by your background, um, your involvement in youth structures, and then also why are you interested in committing your time and energy to serve the youth of South Africa and the NYDA board and also your knowledge. Can you share your knowledge with us and the agency? Thank you. Thank you so much to the honorable members who have invited me here today to speak. Uh, my name is Advocate Tandos Bongiseni Kumete. And um, as an African person, I say that I come from, or my roots are in KwaZulu Natal. My mother is from Ebola, and my father is from Emlazi, Wayu. Um, however, I was born and bred in Soweto, or rather, born and bred in Johannesburg, born in Soweto, and then moved to the southern suburbs soon after the Group Areas Act was abolished. Um, however, I must mention uh, very importantly that uh, Ebola is my home, really my home away from home. And I spent a lot of time there with my, uh, my cousins and my aunts, and in particular with my grandmother. So I, I very much consider it as much home as uh, Soweto and the south of Johannesburg have been. I um, went to Monjo High School uh, and it was there that I began my career, so to speak, in the sciences and in innovation. Uh, I started participating in science competitions when I was 13 years old and I would come up with ideas of how to solve problems from energy crises to um, issues in aerodynamics to biochemistry affecting women's bodies and um, was very successful in doing so. Uh, all I really wanted to do was to solve problems for society and to come up with creative ways of doing so. And um, I won a number of national competitions provincial competitions, went to TV to go talk about what I was doing. Uh, and this landed me with, um, or well, eventually landed me with a scholarship with uh, the Ellen Gray Obis Foundation. Ellen Gray Obis Foundation seeks um, the top students from around the country, but not just academically. They look for leaders, they look for people who are interested in solving the most pressing social economic problems in South Africa and in the world at large. As a result of that, from the time I was 19 years old, I've been groomed to be an entrepreneur by this organization for the past 10 years. I've also been groomed to be a leader and I've been groomed to try and solve the problems of our time. So after matriculating as one of the top students or rather the, the top all round students um, in my um, high school, I went to Wits University where I pursued my law degree. Um, although I had actually wanted to do engineering, I ended up doing law against my, against my will, but I think it turned out for the best. Um, it was in the university context that I was met with the hostility of patriarchy. I got into student politics quite early in university. In my second year, I was the gender officer for SASCO, BEC. And I had noticed a tendency of being called a, what I believed then to be a very vulgarous word, which is a feminist. I thought it was vulgarous because it was made to be um, a word that was insulting to society at large and was violent in particular to men because I vocalized my opinions 
So whenever we had to come up with decisions about um, the particular events or how to develop our society in university, because I had expressed my views, I was then called this vulgarist word of a feminist. I was referred to a feminist so long that I eventually decided that if me speaking up for myself makes me a feminist, if me believing that I'm on equal footing with all other human beings makes me a feminist, then that is what I am. And that was the beginning of my struggle of um, being a feminist in society and trying to um, rebalance the scale so that every human being has got the right to fully realize themselves. Um, so after entering into the political arena, I then was involved in a number of youth um, projects. Um, I was actually asked by the largest youth leadership organization in the world called ISEC. It was committed to exchanging people, giving cultural exchanges to people who were young leaders, also grooming the next generation of young leaders. And I was asked to please reignite ISEC at Wits University because it had been disbanded after apartheid. It was removed from the institution because they did not want to associate with a racist institution. And it, I did not have funding. I did not have much resourcing. Um, but I did use um, the power of collaboration and of partnership to reignite that organization to what it is now. And um, I remember in the first year that we managed to have the highest membership um, in the country in spite of not having resources. Um, so from then, I've been involved in a lot of community projects with Alan Grobe's foundation. I've done a lot of recruitment of young leaders around the country. So I don't just consider myself um, a young leader, but I've also been involved in looking um, for the next generation of leaders around the country and selecting them for scholarship opportunities that will, will change their lives. Um, I also started um, operating in the national gender machinery. Um, I was invited to represent Wits University at Person, my time is says uh, Tando's time for her introduction is up. Yes, it has lapsed, Chairperson. I will hand over to you and the members to pose questions. If you can just guide us with the members' indication for for questions. Honorable Maluleke, Honorable How Nelson, we are Paramis. Oh, sing my girl. Honorable Maluleke, Honorable Baha, Honorable Matebula, and Honorable Malika. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And uh, advocate Kumek. In your introduction, you went to town about your involvement in youth structures, and it's so much exciting. But I just want to pose this question to you. If you are appointed as a board member, how are you going to advocate for young people who are in deep rural areas to benefit from NYDA programs? Mm. Thank you, Chair. Honorable member, thank you so much for that question. And um, I think the relevance in my introduction in mentioning the fact that Ebola is my, is my home away from home is that I understand I truly understand the plight of um, a young person who is in, in an environment that was systematically created for them not to flourish. Not just um, through colonization, but also um, 
culture itself has participated in making sure that black children in rural communities do not flourish beyond that space. So for me, it is about thinking about the rural space not as an alien space. What I've noticed is that people tend to think that young people in the rural areas or people in the rural areas have got a different way of processing information that their minds are perhaps smaller than those of the people living in, in urban areas. Um, and this is not true. And what we ought to be doing is to be bringing infrastructure into the rural areas, in particular ICT infrastructure into the rural areas. A couple of weeks ago, we had a national consultation on rural development. And I was frustrated when someone said that we needed to use USSD technology because those people in the rural areas don't have access to that technology. But that is precisely why having collaborations and partnerships is important. There are organizations like Microsoft and Google that have gone across the African continent, empowering people by giving them the internet infrastructure, devices, as well as hotspotting data so that they can be able to access the internet and information. For me, one of the biggest things that I want to see happening, should I take this position, is to completely transform the idea that technology cannot exist in rural spaces and that infrastructure cannot exist in rural spaces. And I understand that we are limited by our budget and I'm going to get to that, to the issue of the budget. But we need to use this platform and its power and its, its, its positionality and its influence to create the collaborations and the partnerships that will enable us to develop our communities. People in the rural areas, youth in the rural areas do not have access to information. So it's not even that they don't want to do something. It's that they don't even know that that thing exists. Because for me, if I want to know about something, all I need to do is to Google it on my device. We are not born knowing everything. And information needs to be passed down to us. And internet has been one of the biggest bridges that have been able to, to give access to, uh, access to information to people that they never had before. And that ought to be something that we give to rural youths. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tando. Uh, uh, but uh, I want to ask you a question in relation to the NYDA Act. Uh, what is your understanding uh, about the functions of the NYDA Act? We want to hear your own understanding. Mm. So my own understanding is that the act is supposed to be a guidance. It's supposed to be an orient for all the people who serve under the NYDA to make sure that in our service, we uphold a particular standard of ethics to ensure that we do everything that is to the best interest not only of the entity itself but to the youths that we are serving in this country the youths that we are purporting to develop in this country it also is supposed to bridge the gap of understanding of how the resources that we get and the resources that we have ought to be used and distributed in a manner that will make sure that it, it is not, um, I don't want to use this generic word, but it's the only one on my tongue, that it is not wasted. Everyone seems to be using the word wasted, but um, it is also supposed to help to guide us on how monies are supposed to be spent. Without the money that is budgeted for, we cannot execute the development in this country. And therefore it is important for all of the office bearers and the officials and the authorities that have been described in the act to know what their roles and responsibilities are in relation to the youth development project in South Africa. And for us to be able to be guided in terms of when someone doesn't act in accordance with that. Yeah. 
No, thank you. Thank you, Chepesi. Um, I think at this point, Sisi, we are confronted with the coronavirus to a point that uh, a huge or a large percentage of young people are unemployed. Um, if you were to be appointed um, to form part of the board, what is it that you would do to turn the lives of young people around, but also what kind of partnerships would you enter into to kind of improve the lives of those that are relying on getting the 350 rands that the government provides at this particular point? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for that question. Um, this, this question is a very, it, it's one that really goes to the core of a lot of what I stand for. South Africa's economic model is inherently a patriarchal one. It is a model that suggests that it is okay for a young girl not to go to school because she's taking care of a sick grandmother. It is an economic model that says that because you are a woman and because you are black, you ought to earn less for a job description that is the exact same as your counterpart in your, in your working environment. It is an economic model which uses the word the informal economy to legitimize the fact that we want to disrespect a person who wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and works as a domestic worker, but because they're a domestic worker, they are called a servant of the informal sector. It is also the same economic model which shut down the vendors on the side of our, on the, the, the street entrepreneurs on the side of the road because they were not deemed to be as legitimate as your pick and pays and your checkers and your Woolworths in spite of the fact that they were selling the exact same thing in stores. So for me, coronavirus, and we've been saying this, is that it merely indicated to us what the real issues were in our society. The first thing, before I even get to the economic aspect, is the lack of consultation of government with relevant demographics is absolutely unacceptable because had government consulted with CSOs, they would have known not to make some of the decisions that they had made. They decided to close down the informal economy and then reopen it again. But by that time, people were already starving to such an extent that when trucks came into the townships, people were pelting those trucks with stones so they can get the food out of there. That is unacceptable. I want to start by saying that one of the most revolutionary things that we can do, honorable member, is for us to create a paid care work economy in South Africa using a national structure or using a structure in which there is funding for people who want to work as care workers. But I would caution that if we were to do this, to only allow care workers who are of the age of 18 and above because I also don't want to encourage the fact that children are not finishing or young people are not finishing their education so that they can go and look after someone. It needs to be a, consen a consensual uh, decision, one that they make on their own to say, I can make money from doing this so that I can get to the next step of my life. So um, that's the first thing. The next is that I really want to unpack the issue of um, entrepreneurship in South Africa and innovation. South Africa has got some of the most intelligent people I've ever come across. I, 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 I lie to you not. But South Africa is a graveyard for ideas and innovation. And we have normalized it. I mentioned earlier that I started participating in expos when I was a child. But with me, were thousands of other children from all over the country who had amazing ideas to solve issues around energy crisis, around water, new implements in technology, but we don't see those ideas anymore. 
I would want for the NYTA to collaborate with that program and that event on a yearly basis, to take in those young innovators, especially the ones who make it to the National Expo, to give them training around intellectual property because the ownership of ideas, especially as Africans, is incredibly important. And especially for black women who have had their ideas terrorized since time immemorial. We teach them about patenting, how to draft their business plan, how to pitch, how to present themselves. That doesn't cost money, or it doesn't cost a lot of money because that competition is already taking place. And the schools are the ones that are already responsible for bringing in and recruiting those um, children with special talents. All we're doing is we're intervening to say, let's take your idea and let's make something out of it that is meaningful for the whole economy. What we then do from there is that we bridge the gap between these innovative ideas, us teaching them how to turn it into business ideas, and then we link them to the biggest um, innovation hubs in the country, like your GAP, your um, technology innovation agencies, your CSIRs, and we make sure that they fall into that ecosystem. <laughs> Yeah. No, Chair, I'm fine. Okay. Honorable Malika. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, advocate, as we know that uh, effective governance in the public services encourages better decision making and the efficient use of resources. If you can be recommended for appointment uh, to the, to the, for the board, how would you ensure good governance in the NYTA and what role would the board of directors play in terms of the PFMA in the NYTA? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, unfortunately, I have to say that when it comes to the legislation um, itself, there are a couple of things that I'm unhappy about that I think need to be amended. Um, the first is that with the Public Finance Management Act, there is an opportunity for people to write off expenditure that is irregular and to condone expenditure that is irregular. That is inappropriate and unacceptable. I'm not sure if I were to see the statements how many, because I, I hear that there's been six clean audits. However, what the legislation also says is that when a transaction that is irregular um, has been condoned or written off, it then does not appear on the statements. What that does is that it gives an opportunity for officials and for, and for um, the authorities to participate in potentially corrupt behavior. That writing off and the derecognizing of irregular expenditure has to be done away with. At the very least, what should happen is that those expenditures should be made transparent, even if they have been written off, so that we can be able to see that how. In 2021, there were 20 irregular expenditures amounting to 100 million rand that were written off. Why is that? And then we can be able to investigate. So um, coming into office, uh, <laughs> that would probably be the, my main contention and my, my main bone to pick. It just absolutely doesn't make sense to me how we could potentially be jeopardizing our very limited resources by allowing people the opportunity to accept an irregular expenditure. An irregular expenditure being something that is in contravention of legislation, it shouldn't be allowed. Honorable Masigo. Thank you uh, very much, Honorable Chairpersons. Uh, we are from Herikwala District. 
the municipal city you come from? Which is in Ipula is the Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma municipality. I was excited when you were doing your introductory remarks and you mentioned the fact that you actually sit or sit in the national gender machinery. Now, the question I want to ask is that if or should you be appointed in the board, how or what innovative programs would you bring to the NYDA to ensure that we are having more young women from especially rural based areas, you know, to become the future uh, Dr. Nkosazana Zumas, the future advocate Kumedes like yourself. So, you know, with, with the experience that you are bringing from sitting like uh, in national structures like the national gender machinery, how would we ensure that we are uh, equalizing or leveling the playing ground to ensure that you are pulling young women from those areas that you know you would at least expect you know to find the doctors to find the advocates thank you chair thank you so much for that question honorable member um so i just want to reiterate again the fact that um our budget is a limited budget however we make very clear that the rural areas is a site um, that is a priority to youth development in the country. And in particular, women being vulnerable. Um, this is very important. I, I have an idea that um, what we should be doing is looking to create partnership with organizations in the private sector that would like to reach out to the demographic that we want to reach out to. What we then do with that relationship, let's assume maybe that it's a bank, okay? And I'm, I'm going to um, con you know, make sense of, of, of where I'm going, but let's assume that it's a bank. It's a bank that wants to reach the rural areas because there are many people in the rural areas who are unbanked. So what we do then is that we form a relationship with a banking institution and we say we need mobile units that will enable us to go and do um, information sessions, that will enable us to do career guidance and be able to reach the market that is typically unreachable. Now what those people get in return is that they are able to to speak to the market to say that, look, uh, you're a young person, do you have a bank account? Come and open a bank account with us. And so it's, um, it's a symbiotic relationship and it's a win-win situation. I think it would be unfair for me to say that, um, you know, we can do all of these very extensive travel arrangements around the country on the very limited budget that we have. We need to be a bit smarter and a bit more strategic. And I think that, um, in particular because the banking industry is looking and is pushing to get more and more people banked, it would be wise for us to have a relationship with an organization like that, or with an institution like that, and use that to move across the country. Um, and yeah, to provide the um, information and services um, using the mobile, mobile units in that way. Thanks. Uh, Honorable uh, Ndongeni. Oh, okay. No, I'm, gonna I'm covered so far. Oh, okay. All right. Bula? And I can say, Chairperson, says Tandu, in your own opinion, what causes political interference in the administration? And if you are elected as a board member and you come across politicians who want to interfere on your work, what are you going to do? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Honorable Member. That is a very powerful question. And um, 
it sits at the core of what seems to be a disease and an ailment in our society. But it's not a new ailment. As I mentioned earlier that um, during the colonial era in South Africa, the powers that be negotiated with cultural leaders, particularly in communities like rural communities, they negotiated power to ensure that black people did not have the opportunity to develop beyond a certain point, that they did not develop beyond being laborers, slave laborers for white capital in South Africa. And so, and many people think that corruption is a new thing, it's really not. That is why it is so sophisticated. That is why it is so silent and has been the deadly disease of us ever being able to, re to practically realize an equitable society. I also mentioned earlier that I'm a feminist, but I'm not just any kind of feminist, honorable member. I am a feminist on a mission to dismantle white heteropatriarchy. And so when someone comes to me to say to me that they want to offer me a particular amount of money so I can derail the youth development project in this country, they are derailing my values, my, my, my core values, and the sentiments around why I do what I do and why I exist in the way that I exist. So I'm not sure if it matters to you at all, but I have no interest in taking bribes from people. And everything that I've done up to this point um, has been a self-sacrifice of my virtues and my beliefs. If I wanted to, I could have gone and been a lawyer at a firm and to work along with white monopoly capital. I didn't do that. I've sacrificed a lot for me to be who I am and where I am today, because I genuinely believe in the development project of this country. And I authentically believe that the biggest plague of our society is the unresolved dismantling of racism, structural racism, of heteronormativity, and of patriarchy. And I am committed to that. And I have laid my life and my fiber to the attainment of, of that dismantling, but also the attainment of equity in our society. So I have no interest in that at all. Thank you very much, uh, Tando. <laughs> See what they are doing to me. Ha! Hey, boo. I do tell this in there. Thank you very much, Tando. Do you have questions? Uh, any question or questions that you want to ask the panel? Yes, I do, actually. Um, so I noticed in your legislation that let me say in the legislation, that um, there was a reference to equity. However, I did not see in the language beyond that, the resonance of equity as a fundamental core value of the NYDA. And I think I would like to ask for anyone perhaps to tell me what their understanding of equity is, because equity is very distinct from equality. It doesn't, equality doesn't work, and we've realized that. We want equity. But because I couldn't see my, my people very often, um, queer people, um, and usually when people mention queer people, um, they do it as a matter of tokenism. I also didn't see um, language that sought to bring about a black 
intentional black empowerment and to not tiptoe around the fact that it is black people in South Africa who are the most vulnerable to centuries of violence. So I wanted to understand what is your understanding of equity so that when I come into this space or if I come into the space, we can both be aligned because equity is a critical value in um, the South Africa we are trying to build. And it is also a critical value in my own work and the legacy that I wish to leave behind. Thank you. <coughs> Honorable Bacha, uh, do you want to respond to Tando or? I think uh, Utando was uh, asked. Yes. Yeah, that's what I want you to say to Utando. Oh, good. See, some of the questions uh, we are still going to ask them to other uh, candidates. So we are not going, we are not in a position to respond. Okay. Uh, to some of those questions, because if we respond now, we should say about copy seal. Okay. No. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. So, are we done for the day, or? Yeah. Um. We, we you are done for the day. Okay. Um. We thought that maybe you will ask us uh, in terms of the process. Uh, oh, I'm gonna I still ask that one. <laughs> okay. You can ask. <laughs> I would like to know um, when the results are going to come out. <laughs> okay. Honorable uh, Ntlangwini, can you explain to Tando when are the results? You don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's good, you know, sometimes when you ask, you ask, you give members an opportunity to speak uh, and when they are busy with other things, Okay. Uh, and, uh, advocate, um, thank you very much, Chair. Obviously, we are running interviews <coughs> up till the rest of the week. Yes. Um, with all of the candidates. After then, uh, we will most probably um, have our deliberations by next week, and then um, possibly then that um, report is gonna. Uh, be tabled into Parliament. So after that de de deliberations, we will let you know, and then the report will go to Parliament for Parliament's approval, and then um, be sent to the President for him to make the final selection. Thank you very much. Chair. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ntangwini. Uh, Honorable Nasigo. Thank you, um, Honorable Chair. It's just a minor addition in that um, since we are running a, an open and transparent uh, interview process, you'll even be able to see live the deliberations that the committee would be doing. So any decision that will be taken and the deliberations that will be taking place after the interview process, as Honorable Ntlangwini had explained, will be broadcast live on the uh, uh, social media platforms as well as the parliamentary uh, TV channel 408 on DSTV. So as and when we are doing whatever we are de deliberating on as young people yourself and the other young people across the country would be able to be privy to the information that we're having. So you'll be having, you know, a, 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 the actual blow by blow a, occurrences of the committee. Thanks. Okay, no, thank you so much. I think that's all I have to um, ask. I would like to say, however, that, um, oh, thank you very much for inviting me once again. And um, it is my hope that whatever decision you make, that we can now begin to breathe in a new consciousness um, into this organization that is truly going to be committed in executing meaningful impact. And I'm emphasizing actual impact on the youth development agenda in South Africa across the nation. And that whoever you decide to pick, and this is not necessarily a message for you, but since you are online, that whoever is picked for this board, please do not interfere 
we can no longer as the youth of this country afford for there to be interference in how we are developing. And this is not necessarily for the people in this room, it's more for the other people that are watching and listening. I would be very happy or rather I would like to say, um, just stay out of bothering an already an exceptionally vulnerable group of people who have lost a lot of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tando. Chair, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Advocate, thank you very much for honoring the invite to come for the interview before this panel. We wish you well in your future endeavors. And um, as uh, Member Masika has said, you are free to watch our deliberations um, after the interview because it will be open and fair and our administrative staff will be in touch with, with, with our candidates. But thank you and wishing you well. You are excused. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you very much, honorable members. Uh, the next candidate will be on visual interview and uh, by the name of Shaira Kahl. So um, I'm not sure whether she has logged in or what. Marcel? Is the candidate ready? Oh, okay. Marcel, the visual one. It's the visual. Okay. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Chaperson, uh, the candidate is. What? Chair, is, is all our members in the house? What? Is all the members in, in the room? Yeah. I'm here, Chair. Oh. Okay, thank you, Don Katie. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Ms. Carla, um, welcome to, to this um, interview session. Um, I want you to relax, my dear, and also to, to sit back. You're giving us a very nice smile, which means you are relaxed. Whenever you feel a little bit stressed, drink some water. Um, we want you to enjoy this interview. And um, let me take the opportunity to thank you for honoring the invite to, um, to this interview um, of the NYD board. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce myself first of all. My name is Marin Shekillian. I'm the chairperson of the Select Committee on Health and Social Services in the NCOP. And I'm also the co-chairperson of this committee um, to, to, to select the members of the NYDA board. I'm going to hand over to the chairperson in the other side. 
in, in, in Parliament to introduce herself and also to the rest of the members that side. Thank you, Chairperson. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is I'm the chairperson of this portfolio committee of the portfolio committee on women, youth, and persons with disabilities. Honorable Masigo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, good afternoon to our candidate, Ms. Tala. My name is Figile Masigo. I'm a member of the subcommittee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons. My name is, good afternoon to Ms. Kala. My name is Audra Malika, a member of the subcommittee. You are welcome on the virtual platform. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairpersons. Uh, my name is Louis Olum PT, and I'm a member of this committee, and a warm welcome to you, Ms. Kala. Um, thank you, Chairperson, um, or Chairpersons, um, and uh, good afternoon to you, Ms. Kala. My name is Mbule Lopaha, and I'm a member of this committee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairpersons, and um, good afternoon, Ms. Kala. My name is Telisom Kweba. I'm a member of this committee, and you are welcome. Good afternoon, Ms. Kala. Um, my name is Natasha Nshangweni. I'm a member of this committee. All the best with your interview. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Kala. My name is Witumelo Joyce Maluleke, a member of this committee. Akin Sacha Pesan. I'm a member of this committee. Thank you. Member Tom Kenny. Thank you, Chair. Afternoon, Ms. Kala. My name is Noguzola Ndongeni, member of the committee. Thank you, members. Ms. Kala, um, can you perhaps briefly tell the panel members more about yourself, um, who Saira Kala is? Give us a little bit of background. Also, your involvement in youth structures or youth um, empowerment. And then also, Ms. Kala, can you share with us why you are interested in committing your time and energy to serve on the NYDA board and also your knowledge? Can you share your knowledge about the agency with the panel? Thank you. You will have five minutes to answer this question. I also need to inform you that for every question, you will have four minutes to answer, and on a supplementary question, you will have two minutes to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to just express my gratitude to the committee for being understanding uh, and agreeing to have this virtual interview, given that my father is unwell. Um, in sharing who I am, I can talk to my academic experience, my professional experience, and my commitment to a life of activism for social justice, and how these diverse uh, skills have made me interested in this, uh, in this uh, agency. So I'll start with my academic qualifications. I studied a BCom philosophy, politics, and economics degree at Fitz University, and I also did my honors in political science. I then did a MSc in African Studies uh, at Oxford University. And I think like most members on this committee, my biggest learning took place outside of the classroom as a student activist and a member of the student movement. And I know Honorable Mpiti will remember us being on opposing colors on campus, but I'll touch on that in a bit. Then in terms of my professional experience, I'm currently fulfilling two roles. Uh, the first is as a board member at Section 27. And the second is as a, a researcher at the UJ Center for Social Change. I've been looking at uh, the government's response to COVID 
and particularly uh, from a civil society perspective, uh, looking at trade unions. This work is commissioned by the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the NRF and uh, GTAC, which is an agency of National Treasury. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some previous work. So I was a member of the Africa Regional Advisory Group at Amnesty International. I also have done some freelance uh, projects with the Institute for Economic Justice, uh, with the Center for um, the Southern Center for Inequality Studies, SCIS, and I've been dabbling in documentary filmmaking. And I think last and most important, my activism. I've uh, always been very interested in building and being involved in community. And that's been important to me. As a high school student, I tutored uh, English and mathematics in Shashonguve. As a student at Wits University on my first day during all week, I was involved in student activism. And I went on to serve as the president of the Wits uh, SRC. One of the notable campaigns that we ran uh, was the One Million One Month campaign. And that was something that raised 4.4 million rand for students uh, through crowdfunding, crafting relationships with alumni and uh, the private sector. And obviously, uh, something that I need to note is my involvement in the Fees Must Fall campaign, uh, a movement that shook the core of our society. Uh, and once I went off to Oxford University, um, I got involved in the Oxford Africa Conference, and um, that allowed me to, to understand issues on a continental level. Most recently, um, in terms of an, being an alumni from Oxford, we wrote to the university asking them to, to take a stand on the right side of history in terms of vaccine apartheid and to um, affirm support for the president's call for a TRIPS waiver at the WTO. I've also um, you know, uh, been involved in the C19 People's Coalition, which really affirms everyone's moral and social right to the economy through a basic income uh, that is universal. And I think, you know, just to talk a bit about the second part of your question, um, young people are feeling quite hurt and betrayed. There's, there seems to be little in our favor and we're pushed to involve ourselves in issues around leadership, governance and service. Um, in terms of the national youth policy, um, youth um, need to benefit from a government, government that is uh, vertical, horizontal and transversal structures. Uh, aligning national development priorities informed by youth needs and proper planning which places youth at the center. And I think that the National Youth Development Agency is at a unique position through being an institutionalized structure that we need to commend the government for having um, that can really chart a way forward and be a way to coordinate and synergize all the different efforts around youth development and around really understanding that youth represent the future at the table and need to be given a space to do that. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Ms. Carla. I will hand over to the chairperson to guide me with the other members' questions. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Honorable PT. Honorable Ntlangwini, Honorable Mkweba, and uh, Honorable Masiko. Uh, the last person will be Honorable Maluleke. And Honorable Dongeni's hand is also raised. Okay, and Honorable Dongeni. Thank you, Chairpersons. Um, Ms. Kala, I think you know we 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 can all agree, together as honourable members as well as yourself, that South Africa is facing a huge, huge problem with youth unemployment, and a huge part of the the reason we have the highest unemployment rate in the world amongst young people is because we have a structural unemployment crisis, and so I want to understand from your side, should you be appointed onto the NYDA board, how exactly can you detail the structural unemployment crisis in this country? And exactly what would you do um, in terms of looking for new sectors that speak to different skills required for young people to be more employable within this economy? Thank you. Uh, Chair, do you want me to answer that question and then we go on to the following ones once I'm done? 
No, you can answer the questions as it is posed to you. Okay. So you can answer now. Okay, thank you, Chair. That's a very critical point. Um, and I think the reality is very disheartening. Um, we have a youth unemployment rate of 74.7%. And the scale and social devastation that this poses is existential. And uh, we need to consider the expense of inequality in our country in terms of scale and time. So on the one hand, we can talk of the presidency wanting 2 million new jobs over the NDP target. But the fact of the matter is that uh, even if we, we, we were to have uh, the NDP's target of a Gini coefficient of 0 0.6 by 2030, it would still place South Africa's income inequality as the highest in the world. So perhaps it's time for us to shift our attention away from flaws and towards pathways. And I like the second part of this question because it pushes us to be proactive in what we're going to do. And I think that actions need to be widespread and long-term we really do not have till 2030. But I think what's also important is as a board to understand the impacts of austerity and um, how this is actually a human rights issue. The BJC is a coalition of more than 200 civil society organizations, social movements, trade unions, and they've called on parliament, they, last year they called on parliament to reject the budget and uphold human rights. Because cuts to health, social grants, basic education, um, of the range of around 265 billion are actually an attack on our constitutional rights. So when we talk about jobs creation and entrepreneurship, and we talk about the presidential youth um, uh, employment intervention, we need to understand that we can't talk about one without the other. We can't have silos in these discussions. Some of the new sectors that I think are very important for us to explore need to come from youth themselves. But in the conversations that we've been having to young people with young people, it seems that there is a lot of excitement around um, discussions around technologies and you know the digital um, economy, but there's also a lot of fear about increasing inequality that we're seeing in other countries as well as in South Africa. Um, the 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 backtracking on long won rights, um, worker rights, um, basic conditions of employment act, but also a shift towards. Um, uh, focusing on, on basic incomes and on jobs as not mutually exclusive. I think that if we talk about agriculture just in terms of rural youth, that is unfair. We need to be a, a, a bit diverse and allow youth to also understand which areas they are interested in and to then be a body that is uh, goes forward with the aspirations of young people together. So another area that I think is quite important um, is uh, looking at a, uh, the care economy and understanding that issue uh, uh, that care work needs to be valued in South Africa. Um, if we look at young doctors, junior doctors as well, and the nurses that work alongside them, there are some serious issues with the levels of exploitation and difficulties that they go through. So this has to be something that we consider from multiple angles, but I think the most important thing is to let to listen and to understand um, where the world is going, the, the global changes in, in the world right now. Um, and I, I find that sometimes when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and new sectors for economic growth, we forget the human beings at the center of those systems. And that for me is a, a very problematic way of understanding it. If you think about the presidential um, committee on the fourth industrial revolution, they go through a number of sectors and a number of areas that are important. But um, really speaking, youth are not uh, dealt with explicitly. And that's why I think the role of the National Youth Development Agency in thinking about policy is so critical. What is the, the, youth, the, the, the National Youth Development Agency saying on, uh, on, on, on gender-based violence, on, on, on pay gaps, um, and on what happens inside every sector that is systemic? Uh, those are the kinds of issues that are cross-cutting uh, that are very crucial for all of us to, to care about. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kala. Can we go to the next member? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, Ms. Kala, um, I'd just like to find out from you, currently the NYDA 
have been in the media and have been seen uh, across to very young uh, to young people that um, having this negative perception and are being clouded by this dark cloud over it with political interference. If you were to become a board member, how will you ensure that this doesn't happen and that this negative cloud uh, are going away over the NYDA and serve young people in the rural communities that are um, even selling um, your spinach on the street and making their businesses lucrative. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that, that question. I think the independence of the NYDA is of paramount importance and that's precisely why I've applied because even in my activism during um, Fees Must Fall and, and as, a, as a member of the SRC, Although I had a political affiliation at the time, it never was something that shrouded out the importance of um, being political, but also being non-partisan, non-divisive, and not allowing political agendas to get in the way of serving your mandate. And so I think that um, no external undue influence uh, on the budget, on the strategy, on the operations of the NYDA uh, should take uh, should, should take uh, any shape or form, and that is the role of the board to ensure complete independence, but also aligning to the national development plan, the national youth framework, and um, having in the independence to execute and realize goals. So we want politically active engagement that is nonpartisan, and that's something that's really lacking in the space. Uh, young people have a lot to say, but there's no coherent voice, and I think the diversity on a board is very healthy, but also the independence of each member on the board uh, needs to align with the goals as a collective. I think rural, rural youth, as you correctly identify, have been extremely uh, ignored uh, and undermined for far too long. Uh, just yesterday, uh, someone had messaged me, um, we were on a panel discussion together and she's studying the same degree that I studied in uh, rural Eastern Cape through UNISA. And she wanted to get in touch and see how we can collaborate because we were discussing a basic income guarantee. And so there's relationships, there's networks that need to be built. And I think that we also need to see opportunities um, across the board in South Africa. So when we think about exchange programs with um, people abroad, why aren't we thinking about exchange programs within the country and how that can also relate to the National Youth Service, which the president is going to now expand in the uh, presidential youth um, employment initiative. And those are the things that I think are important. But like I said earlier, listening and being very much humbled by what young people themselves in rural communities, young collect uh, collectors of young people themselves have to say about what they want and what aspirations they see they can, th that can be realized through the NYDA and through the structures that the NYDA has um, at its disposal. Thank you. Can we have the next member? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. Kala. One of the main objectives of the NYD Act is to develop an integrated youth development plan and strategy for South Africa. Develop guidelines to, for the implementation of the strategy and make recommendations to the president. So Ms. Kala, can you all elaborate before this panel your understanding of the integrated youth development strategy and why the strategy is important for youth development in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, honorable member. I was actually really pleasantly surprised by how uh, coherent the integrated youth development strategy is. There's a strategic framework um, that speaks to five areas, five pillars, quality education, skills and second chances, economic transformation, entrepreneurship and job creation, physical and mental health promotion, including COVID, social cohesion and nation building and effective and responsive youth development machinery. And I think that all five of these pillars work really well together, but obviously the devil is in the detail. 
Um, what's also noted is the fourth industrial revolution, and that's been identified as a cross-cutting theme uh, in these five policy pillars. I think that when it comes to the NYDA and the integrated youth development strategy, um, the, 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 there needs to be a very clear understanding that we can no longer focus on short-term projects um, that have nice goals at the end of them and that are in a particular limited sphere of control. The NYDA needs to understand the difference between a limited sphere of control and a very broad sphere of influence. And it needs to take advantage of the broad sphere of influence that it has been silent on for, for quite some time. So I can't think of a time where the NYDA actually gazetted a policy. Um, and I think that's a problem. You know, we need to uh, understand the NYDA's role as also being a space for disruptive thinking, for keeping government um, and, and, and governance thinking on, on its toes and moving in different directions, thinking about what people across the world are doing and what young people across the world are thinking. The world is getting smaller and smaller. And so I think the strategic framework gives us something to work with. It's also very, very important that it's not couched in um, just job creation and entrepreneurship, because while those are extremely important, there's a whole range of other issues that need to be considered. And so I'm, I'm hopeful for what this can bring forward in that regard. Thank you, Ms. Carla. Can we get the next member to ask a question? Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Ms. Carla, what in your view are the personal qualities as well as the desired attributes uh, of board members that are critical for a successful operation of uh, the NYDA board. And I'm asking that question because I believe that there's an incorrect perception of young people out there that seeks to say that um, by virtue of being young, uh, 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 the youth are unable to manage successfully, you know, the boards due to their inability to pay attention to detail. And you'd find that sometimes they would not even uh, be able as busy the, as they are to respond to something as simple as an email on time. So in, in your view, what personal attributes would you uh, uh, believe are essential for any person to occupy a, a, a position of a, a board of directors? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that administrative efficiency is very important. Um, as important is uh, board experience, um, understanding about uh, oversight and what fiduciary responsibility means practically, and exposure to policy issues. Somebody who understands things at a big picture level is able to um, see things unfolding, um, has an eye on the ground, but also um, you know, has relevant uh, academic and, and other expertise. It's not just academic expertise. Um, qualifications are one thing, but lived experiences are also very much um, as important. So um, having a proven track record is very important, I think. Thank you, Ms. Carla. The next member can pose the question. Maluleke. Uh, thank you very much, Chairpersons. Ms. Kala, effective governance in the public service encourages better decision making and the efficient use of resources. I think you'll uh, agree with me on that one. Then my question would be, how would you ensure good governance in the National Youth Development Agency if you are recommended to the board, to be part of the board? And what are the five main principles of good governance within the context of a democratic government and efficient public service? What would you do to enhance the NYDA to conform to principles of good governance? Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, so much for that very critical question. Um, there are three areas that I think are very important in measuring and understanding good governance. Um, we know that the NYDA is a Schedule 3B organization and that therefore its budgeting processes are governed by Section 6 of the Public Finance Management Act, the PFMA. 
And we know that uh, this already gives us uh, a credible financial framework um, to work from. Uh, the PFMA uh, emphasizes secure transparency, accountability, and sound management of the revenue and expenditure and assets and liabilities to which uh, you know, the NYDA has access to. Um, and I think that institutionalizing a scrupulous self-questioning and accountability beyond simply clean audits is really critical. I think there needs to be a higher standard to see value created from money spent and the effectiveness of pro programs, but also the long-term expectations because we don't have time for short-term programs. They need to be systemic and long-term. I think, you know, if I can give an example about um, I, if I can move to the second uh, area that I think is important, strategic management. Um, and as per the, the integrated youth development strategy, we've seen those five pillars that I spoke about. But the NYDA also has a responsibility to ensure that um, digital technologies are deployed in an equitable and just manner. So for example, there's the new um, SAYouth.mobi um, platform that, that was launched on Youth Day that the president spoke about in his June 16th address. Um, and it's important to note that that is zero rated, but it's also important to understand that uh, when we talk about good governance, we also know that in rural areas, digital infrastructure is not always a reality. So the NYDA then has a systemic responsibility to um, talk about what's happening on that front and to ensure that whatever we work we do, we are, we're, we're dealing with those gaps and we're trying to eradicate them so that we level the playing field. And then thirdly, on an operational management level, the board has oversight to ensure that programs are well managed, that partnerships are optimized, that finance, financial and governance integrity and effectiveness uh, is, is sound. And also, I think what's gone wrong with previous boards is that there's been a latitude for management, but they've been lacking in clear strategic oversight and vision. Um, so those are some of the things that I think are most important in understanding good governance in this in this context within the NYDA. Thank you, Ms. Kala. Um, um, Chairperson is the next member, um, Member Dongeni. Thanks, Chair. Ms. Kala? Can you please elaborate on this? There's a youth which is stay in rural areas. There's no infrastructure. There's no smartphones. But they want to know about the NYTA. Secondly, when considering COVID-19, what are the key strategies and innovative approach to address challenge facing the youth the second one, apart from unemployment, briefly highlighted other the key challenges facing youth living in South Africa, including those are living in rural areas. The third one, what are the key best attributes of the NYTA board members? Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you for that uh, um, multi-pronged question. Um, I'll start with the first one on rural youth. And um, I think that uh, the NYDA does have offices across the country um, and they need to be leveraged uh, to reach those who cannot access digital platforms. But we also, again, need to think about um, the long-term plan here. Uh, we can't have uh, access to data that is so expensive and that is so fraught in terms of digital infrastructure. And we also need to ask questions about who owns the digital infrastructures that we're unfolding across the country, because that has long-term impacts for all of us, especially the youth. Um, so I, I guess an audit of sorts could be done to see um, where the NYDA has uh, representation and which areas are left out of this. What was recently launched which is the Youth Explorer um, platform, which gives you uh, data that is specific to, uh, to youth. And they have uh, uh, located data on different offices, not just NYDA offices, also Yes Hubs, um, Harambe Hubs, uh, other, other relevant um, infrastructure that could potentially be used to provide access to data. 
also schools and churches and mosques and uh, cultural institutions, religious uh, spaces, libraries need to be used to, to give access to technology um, and to provide hotspots for, for internet. So that's something that the NYDA can also explore because they've been quite good with partnerships and that needs to, get, to continue. Um, and I think that speaks to some of the in innovation that's needed um, during COVID-19 because it's unacceptable that uh, school goes online and so many people are left out of that. That has long-term implications. It's unacceptable that school feeding schemes, which 9 million children rely on as their main meal, are terminated in, in lockdown. And we have to take government to court for these things. So the NYDA needs to have a say on, on how this, this unfolds. Um, and it's important that even in, 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 uh, when it comes to initiatives around employment, um, you know, yes, as one, one, one example, that the NYDA has representation in those spaces and then can, can adequately collaborate um, so to make sure that we're not duplicating um, work and we're also um, making full use of the resources at our disposal. Um, and the last question was, uh, you know, apart from un unemployment, uh, we have a range of issues. So exploitation is a major issue. Uh, we have a huge number of, of our population that works but still remains poor. Um, and that is something that is, is, is not okay. It's, it's completely unjust, especially considering the history of inequality and the expense of inequality and exploitation in our country. And then we also have um, challenges that everyone else faces. Very few reliable public services, our water systems are being polluted, our healthcare facilities are falling apart and crumbling in the midst of this once in a century global pandemic. So the issues that we face are very many to mention, but I think what's important is that we cannot sit on the sidelines. We have to get involved in these spaces and we have to um, be, be a counter power and, and hold people accountable, but also come with ideas. And we do have those ideas and we need to um, deliberate on what they are and, and, and put, put them into implementation, be a space for experimentation, because um, we can't do the same things over and over again and expect a different result. Thank you, Ms. Gala. Chairperson, is there any member that wants to ask a follow-up question? No. Thank you. Ms. Gala, <clears throat> um, firstly, do you have any questions for the panel? Um, I, I didn't know I would be given the space to ask a question, but I guess, you know, since I have the opportunity, Chair, um, maybe to ask what your biggest concerns are in terms of um, the state of, of the National Youth Development Agency um, and, and what you expect from the new board. Thank you. Can I ask one of the members um, who would like to answer that question? Uh, Chair, we are not in a position to answer uh, the question because those are the questions that we are going to pose uh, to the candidates. So we are expecting candidates to give us the answers since Thank they are the ones who must fill up the gap uh, as board members. So we're not uh, gonna respond to Ms. Kala's uh, question. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for that guidance. Um, Ms. Kala, let me then take the opportunity to thank you for honoring the invitation to um, come before the panel for this interview. We want to wish your father well, that is not well, and, um, and also to wish you well in your further endeavors. The administration um, will get in touch with candidates after we finish with the process, but we're also inviting you to um, watch the channel and the process as it unfolds. And um, we are very, very thankful that throughout your personal um, challenges, you still honored your, your, um, your commitment to come before the channel and we wishing you well. You are excused, Ms. Carla.
Thank you so much, Che. I really appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Okay. Jefferson, are we continuing with the next candidate or are we taking a tea break as per program or are we continuing? Yes, they do lose the flow. Yeah, we only have two left, so we can take a tea break uh, for, for, for 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah. All right, Chair. We're taking a, a, a break for 10 minutes. <laughs> 